All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Christopher. It's really great to have you. Um, I want to kick off um, with maybe just letting you share a little bit about yourself and your journey into the role of CISO with our audience. Yeah, certainly. And I would say it's been quite an interesting path. And I'll go back to college because I think that helps set the scene a little bit on how I got to where I am today. I started off as pre-med when I came out of high school. And unfortunately, I met organic chemistry and some other of the classes in college. Man, I feel like that is the downfall yeah. of all pre-med and, and is I organic joke chemistry. Today that I think that it saved lives, uh, me going through that class probably. So, uh, and, and so I bounced around for a little while uh, during, during school. Uh, at one point, I, I moved from pre-med to sports medicine. I was an athletic trainer for the women's soccer team for a summer. I was that, uh, and then I moved over to the men's and women's swim team. Um, and at that point, I had started majoring in psychology. Kind of realized that I wasn't going to make uh, the money that I was hoping to make once I got out of college, and so I kind of pivoted to uh, economics, where I ended up having uh, a double major in economics and psychology. But the the entire time, though, I was always a computer guy. I grew up with computers. I use them all the time uh, on my hall during my first year in college. Like everybody would come to me and ask how to do certain things because I just had a knack for them. But I didn't think about computer engineering or anything like that when I first went to school because my thought back then, at least, I mean, this was a long time ago, was that the, the computer jobs were working at Radio Shack and being surrounded by hardware. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's that's generally what I what I thought about um, at the time. And so I sort of bounced around a little bit. I, I came out of school. I worked at a small startup in Charlottesville, uh, which is where University of Virginia is. Uh, I worked there for a year. I went and became a economist working for a small Beltway band bandit. Uh, and uh, did risk analysis uh, for utility privatization. So I'd travel all around the country looking at whether or not they should take their water or sewer system or electrical system on a base and privatize, privatize it. Um, and so that's where I first got my uh, view into what risk management actually was and like the trade-off choices and decisions around um, those kinds of things. But I'd say the biggest thing was like I took a pivotal trip to visit uh, one of my best friends who went to Virginia Tech. And, you know, again, that's there's nothing wrong with that uh, as our rival rival college. Uh, but he was working for uh, for a bunch of companies in Silicon Valley. I toured with him and, you know, saw the sock. I think he was at Cisco at the time. And I was just like really enamored with the energy that was out in Silicon Valley and uh, you know, how technology was so different than what I had thought it was. And so as I flew back from from the, uh, San Jose, I think at the time, you know, I sort of made a choice in my mind that I was going to move over to IT. And so that's where my my real experience started. I I went, found a job working for a help desk at a law firm in DC, learned infrastructure, uh, moved to New Orleans, uh, followed my now wife down there when she went to graduate school. And I worked for uh, LSU Health Sciences Center doing sort of a jack of all trades, uh, uh, help desk support and network engineering and infrastructure support. Uh, came back to the DC area, worked as a security consultant for uh, True Secure. Uh, which was a small uh, startup. It ended up becoming CyberTrust and then got acquired by Verizon. And so for several years, I worked as a security consultant. Funny enough, I, I was a security consultant for Fannie Mae uh, for several of those years. And so it's kind of a weird, interesting uh, sort of pivot to what I'm doing today compared to what I was doing, you know, close to 20 years ago at this point. And I also did research at Verizon. So for Several years, I was one of the lead researchers and writers of the Verizon Data Breach Report. So this was from like the second report, so 0809 through when I left uh, in 2015. And so I did nothing but study cyber incidents, uh, came up with a framework to analyze cyber incidents, studied all of these forensic reports. Uh, we created a cyber intelligence center at Verizon at the time, leveraging information from those reports. 
and you know really got an understanding of like how companies could improve their cybersecurity. And then that's where I I took the jump, uh, became a deputy CISO here at Fannie Mae back in 2015, and a year later got promoted. And so you know I've been at Fannie Mae this coming January will be 10 years, and in April uh, I will have been the CISO for nine years. Uh, so it's kind of like I'm in my fourth or fifth CISO life uh, here at Fannie Mae. What an incredible journey. And as unique as your story is, I think it's more common than we give ourselves credit for when we talk to people in leadership today, because there was no cybersecurity degree program. There was maybe computer engineering. How much do you think that the background that you had majoring in economics and psychology and some of the work experience you gained before you fully made the jump into IT and then into security shaped your perspective now as a CISO and how you think about not only your own path, but then maybe some of those who are the future talent coming yeah, into certainly. cybersecurity. And I, I see today that there's a lot of talent out there that isn't in traditional computer science, computer engineering backgrounds. Uh, a lot of the sort of major programs that are that are coming out, they're all founded in a uh, data science, data analytics kind of background. So I do a lot of work with the University of Virginia, uh, the McIntyre School of Commerce down there, and they have a entire uh, program around data science. And you know the skills that you learn there on data science are incredibly helpful when it comes to any sort of, you know, IT and technology job that's out there. You're learning how to code, you're learning how to manipulate data, you're learning how to get insights from data. And that's that's a lot of what we do in technology today are those kinds of things. Uh, but you said something interesting about like my background as with economics and psychology. You know, today that background would actually be the whole field of behavioral economics um, and the whole like, uh, thinking fast and slow when it comes to like Kahneman and Tversky and some of the books that have come out uh, since then. But there's a whole lot of sort of psychology and economics baked into how we do cybersecurity today. So when you think about uh, phishing messages and the cognitive bias and the availability heuristics around clicking on links, and you're doing so without thinking about it because you're not taking a moment to say, Hey, wait a second. Should I click on this or not? You're just an auto drive as you're like, like doing your emails. That is a huge psychology and economics, behavioral economics kind of issue. Like, how do we slow people's thought process down just enough to where, like, you know what? I shouldn't open that attachment because it's from some weird name, and I should. I've never received an email from that person. So there's a lot of psychology that that comes into. Uh, what we do in security today, especially when it comes to the integration of like business and security together. Um, one of the things that I think has been really interesting in 2024 um, is that this is the year we finally have data staying on the data science theme um, on the workforce, on the cybersecurity workforce that shows that demonstrably cybersecurity employers are unable to find experienced workers and yet new cybersecurity workers can't find their first job. And we've intuitively been saying this now for a number of years, but we actually have looked through the job data. 7% of jobs posted for cybersecurity work are currently requiring two or less years of experience. 77 are requiring, you know, over 77% are requiring over that amount. And ISC2 just released its first look for its annual workforce study and found that this is the first year that the um, global workforce in aggregate has actually mm. stagnated. Um, and it's actually kind of tapped out compared to large growth numbers year over year. I'm curious what your take is on that. Is that something that you relate to in your role and you're seeing play out? Or are we over, you know, are we kind of overstating no, I, I the issue? I think that, uh, that that is a, an issue. Uh, you know, when you look at trying to remember the most recent sort of supply demand statistics out there, you know, you always see these numbers out there that there's 3.4 million uh, cybersecurity jobs that are unfilled. Mm -hmm. And then as you mentioned before, you know, it's hard for the uh, folks who have less experience to get that first job. And I think that's partly due to the pressure that is on 
organizations to meet their cybersecurity requirements and and meet the the sort of the the threats that are out there, right? Like you constantly have this educated, uh, un, unyielding threat environment of nation states, organized crime, individual, you know, attackers that are constantly hitting organizations. And on the other hand, you need to have seasoned cybersecurity professionals that can come in to kind of meet those kinds of challenges. And then I think on top of that, you know, you've got different uh, digital transformations that are going on across lots of different companies where there's a a, a massive skill set shift from your traditional uh, cybersecurity skill sets into more uh, developer-like skill sets for cybersecurity engineers, where it's a lot more about in cloud about integration um, and uh, engineering and security as code, compliance as code, and all of those kinds of things. And and so you've got this like um, uh, these uh, f- sort of uh, skill set pieces where you have to do both during the transition, um, and you have to build the skill sets to be able to meet the demand of the IT infrastructures that we're going to be having over the next several years. All the while having all these new challenges that are coming up, right? Quantum, like quantum is going to be a bigger problem uh, or an earlier problem than what we probably thought five or 10 years ago. Uh, Gen AI um, and like all the value that businesses can get out of Gen Gen AI, but how do you secure the Gen AI that your company's wanting to use to create business value for their customers or for internal efficiencies? And so you're constantly trying to defend against. I, I think this is a, actually just reminds me of something. Uh, Dan Gear, who's one of the, you know, huge cybersecurity, you know, wisdom guys over the years, had mentioned something about the asymmetry that comes with cybersecurity, and that we have to protect against all threats that have ever had all threats that are happening today and yeah. all new attacks that might be happening in the future that we are, don't know about. And the bad guys only have to be right one time. And so that's the field of play <laughs> that we're in. And so I, I definitely yeah. uh, understand the challenge. Um, there was also recently, I think it's Daniel Missler, who's a uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, guy that's on Twitter and has his own uh, little uh, company puts out some different information, different newsletters. He actually had a, a a recent discussion just on this very problem around talent shortage and things like that. And he came away with a couple of different interesting uh, takeaways. Um, one is that um, you know applicants don't have a lot of the skill sets to do the work. What you just described, right? Hey, we're looking for people that have five plus years of experience. You know that's because of the the challenges that are out there. Um, few companies have the resources or are looking to train new hires on these things. Um, and you know, that's, it's more apprenticeship like training as opposed to like, Hey, I can go build the talent, you know, early on and then kind of, kind of, uh, uh, move them along. Uh, another one was around just like recruiting an HR, uh, you know, the, the entire process of like matching, uh, skill sets with a sort of the middleman, middle woman, um, HR role also makes it very challenging for for uh, hiring managers. So um, that whole process makes it difficult as well. Um, just in you know, how do you simplify it in a way so that you can uh, you know get the right sort of folks in? But I, I do think it's a mindset change. Uh, you know, we uh, generally have a uh, an associates program where we're bringing in new talent every year. And and finding the right roles for them uh, to be able to learn and grow within the organization, and then you know moving them around uh, to the right thing. So, like one of the things that uh, my team is focused on this next year is like developing a very specific cybersecurity associates program uh, to do just that, kind of build a general skill set so that we can uh, find the right roles uh, for them and kind of fit people in and then help them grow with, with those kinds of uh, opportunities. 
And what's incredible to hear about a program like that you're building is it's embracing what is a long-term approach because you have to grow the talent to what you described at the beginning, which is we have this short-termism because the problem is right in Absolutely. front of us today. Um, you know, and and we as an industry, as a profession, we're kind of stuck in this catch-22 because you need the experienced talent in order to resolve those threats that exist today. But, you know, I sit here and I look and I'm like, you know, this experienced talent is going to start to age out anyway. Um, so if we don't actually solve the bottleneck that we've created in the middle, we're going to actually be in a worse place, you know, five, 10 years down the road as we progress yeah. in this space. Um, the other thing that kind of strikes me um, as you as you bring up kind of, you know, those that are resourced and kind of putting these programs together, there is this dichotomy. I don't know if this is something you've seen in your peer circles of CISOs that, you know, those companies that are most situated um, or have the most resources to build these more long-term programs are also the ones that don't necessarily have to because they can afford to pay the salaries to attract the more yeah. experienced There's a whole talent. concept out there, and I can't remember who coined this um, over the years, but the cybersecurity poverty line. Um, and it's essentially this line uh, yeah. where the uh, more resourced companies have the ability to uh, have the more mature security programs, the more, um, uh, 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 you know, as you mentioned, you know, hire the more seasoned veterans um, in the space um, and be able to manage their threats um, in a different way than those below the, the poverty line who, you know, may not have a CISO. Uh, they may uh, barely have a handful of cybersecurity people, uh, you know, to even handle it. Uh, that the issues at all, or yep. it's just an IT engineer that has security responsibilities. And, and that is a challenge, right? And, you know, one of the ways to kind of look at this in some ways is a lot like the more C, uh, the larger companies that are above the line, you know, they generally have to do business with those below the line. So then it just becomes third party risk for us or fourth party risk. So you end up dealing with the the issue overall anyways, except then you have different kinds of uh, of problems that come out, right? Now your uh, regulatory pressure on the requirements that you put on your third parties, you know, then, you know, basically, you know, elevates what kind of third party you can do business with. Um, and then you lose out on working with smaller businesses and and those that might be further down in the in the uh, below that security property line. So it is, it's, it's one of those challenges that that everybody's kind of working through, uh, trying to, uh, you know, protect your company, um, because ultimately that's our responsibility as CISOs and, and cybersecurity professionals. Uh, but how do you also protect your ecosystem, your industry, and those kinds of things as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we should coin a new term here today about the cyber talent inequity gap. Um, or the inequality gap, because I think what we're describing is a version of that yep. playing out with poverty, right? So those who can have the the talent do and those that can't are just kind of trying to muddle through with maybe a couple IT folks that are also yep. there for security. Um, what? How do you think in your role as a leader and having you know been with your organization for a long time and been in this profession, how do you think about the skills that not only individuals, but your team needs to execute on a security yeah, strategy? I, I mean, I think one of the, uh, you know, big skills is, uh, you know, you have to have leaders that have curiosity um, and that are willing to, uh, you know, ask questions and kind of get down into the, in, into the weeds. You know, I, I try to find folks that are sort of player coaches. Um, so not only uh, do they have the experience of like sometimes doing the work, um, but also uh, the ability to coach those that are now doing the work. And uh, and those are hard, right? You have to find the right skill sets of people who um, have the technical acumen, but also the sort of the leadership capabilities that they've uh, that they've built themselves over time. And, you know, being a leader is a choice, right? You have to choose uh, to develop yourself as a leader, uh, to learn new ways of managing people and building strategies and and those kinds of things. And it's a very different skill set than it is to like, go learn a technical uh, skill set. Hey, I want to go learn cloud security and AWS and go get my security architecture you know certification. Yeah, you can go do that, but it's harder like leading a large 
diverse group of individuals and trying to get everybody moving in the same direction and 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 then being and holding all of them accountable um, for that. So it's it's uh, it's tough. Uh, but I, I will start with, uh, you know, aside from like finding the right kinds of leaders to help lead, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a I, I grew up playing team sports um, and 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 because of that, that's kind of the mindset that I, I bring into um, how I lead my organization, um, but just in general. Um, and, you know, so you want to have people that can play the right roles, um, you know, the right positions. Uh, you want people to have high psychological safety so that they can raise their hand and say, well, you know, I've got some experience in this place. And have you ever considered this? Um, and then you still need to have people on the team that are willing to accept that advice or answering that question. Um, and that's hard, right? Like, do you have to have a team and you have to build this sort of dynamic where people are okay um, getting some type of constructive criticism or advice and, and those kinds of things? And, and that's also tough. Uh, but, but that's one of the challenges of being a leader and running a team. And I kind of go back to when you think about team sports also, you, you think about, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, different kinds of sports where like, Hey, you have a superstar, like a LeBron James in basketball. And you, you, you know, that with that person, like you're going to be able to go really, really far. You can make it to the playoffs or, or whatever. Um, and that would be something that's called a strong leak sport. Like the stronger uh, players you have, the, the further you can go versus what I think cybersecurity is, which is more of a weak link sport. It's probably a lot more like uh, American football or soccer, right? It's, uh, you know, you're only as good as the weakest uh, part of your team. And, and so like in those sports, hey, if your, uh, you know, uh, left defensive back is weak, then that's where you're going to get attacked all the time. And, uh, and you'll see that, especially in a soccer match, you'll just see them going after that part of the field over and over again. Similarly in American football, uh, you know, if, if they know that the cornerback just sprained his ankle um, and, you know, is limping around out there and they've got them in a one-on-one -on -one position, boom, it's, it's over. And they will just go over and over and over again. And I think that's the same thing when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, you know, we have to be able to like raise the boats and skill sets on everybody on the team. Um, and we got to try to eliminate those weak links, uh, not just in technologies and processes, but also, you know, in the, in the people space too, we've got to improve that across the board. I love the team sports analogy, but in full disclosure, Rick Howard and I have a whole article and an episode. We talk about how cybersecurity is like <laughs> money ball in baseball. Um, because for this exact same reason, twofold, one, you know, you're dealing with a limited budget. And so if you can't afford to have the Yankees, you know, salary opportunities, then you're going to have to kind of play the Oakland A's and figure out how to just get to the most important metric and get on base. But one of the things that I think is so inter interesting about mm -hmm. all these analogies is how few times we in the security profession, I've been a consultant and have worked in retail and fight, like I've done all those things too. And sometimes we haven't really done a great job of defining what we think the position mm. on the field is. And then all of a sudden we're surprised when you put a player in the position and all of a sudden we're like, well, you're not doing what we thought you would do. And it's like, well, no one told me what it means to be first base or second base or, you know, no, running back. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, but I also think that the, I was going to say dy dynamicism. I don't think that's the right word. Dynamism of cybersecurity um, is that like you can put a player on the field and the field changes while the position's there. That That's one of the big things about that's different, I think, yeah. in our um, area is that, you know, I can wake up tomorrow and there's going to be a brand new kind of attack that I've never heard of before. And we have to somehow within a few hours protect the company against it. That is unlike most occupations uh, out there, right? And, yeah. and, and I think that's one of the things that I find uh, that I love about cybersecurity and where I have passion around it is that you have that 
kind of uh, continuous learning opportunity where you're always learning, you're always working against some type of active adversary. And, um, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, this tit for tat kind of, kind of thing, right? Like you're, you're, you're trying to get better constantly, uh, trying to shore up your weaknesses all the time. Um, and, and then you're trying to like, look across the field of a vision and, and try to predict in some cases what those, those changes might be. And I think that's the biggest difference, right? Uh, as I mentioned, like, sometimes it's, you're right, like, what I think I need isn't what I need. And so you just have to be able to, uh, you know, quickly learn from that and pivot and fail fast and all those cliches around that kind of thing. And, and just keep moving, um, as they, as they say. What's um final question here? What's your advice then to those who have organizations who are dealing with this constantly dynamic? I'm not even going to try <laughs> and come up with the the version of dynamism, um, but are dealing with this dynamic threat landscape where the the field is changing. How do we think about creating programs to kind of have the right people and get them into the field and grow them and attract and grow those skills that we need to kind of just be resilient in the face of an ever-changing yeah, I mean, threat I think it's, it's the uh, finding the right sort of archetype of a, of a person that uh, can help you with that. So like, as I mentioned earlier, when I try to find leaders that are curious, like the other kind of leaders that I like, and even, you know, folks on the team are what I call thread poolers, right? Like, because a lot of cybersecurity is around like just pulling threads. Hey, I see this thread over here. It's really weird. Here, I'm going to pull this and see where it goes. And like following it to the end and be like, oh, do we have an issue here? What do we need to fix? You know, how do we get in our backlog and, and start working on it? And I think if you find the right people that are curious, thread pullers, uh, you know, are, you know, and, and, um, and, and are willing to have that sort of, continuous learning mindset, then you're going to be able to find the right people to like run those teams because they're going to be eager to learn. They're going to want to learn. They're going to, they're, um, they're going to want to, uh, you know, kind of figure stuff out. Um, I, I think the other piece is, uh, you know, just like, uh, we as a community have to continue to educate our next generation of, uh, cybersecurity engineers, um, analysts, et cetera. And I mean, this is one of the reasons that I, uh, you know, am a, uh, work with the University of Virginia and the McIntyre School of Commerce. In fact, I think this next Monday, I'm actually going to be speaking to a class uh, 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 in, the, in the afternoon. Um, and it's about cybersecurity and the challenges and those kinds of things to kind of help them get a view of what, the, what those kinds of things are. And and I think that's just something that we all have to commit to is how do we educate the next generation uh, to to make them better and and then also find ways to give opportunities uh, to those as they're coming up, you know, from the ranks. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Really appreciate your time and thank you so much You're for welcome. your insights. Take care.